We've been telling you for a while that this offseason will be busy for the Cincinnati Reds, and there are a couple of reasons as to why. We are going to give you the biggest reason why Nick Crawl is going to be in front of your television set quite a lot this winter on today's Locked On Reds. You are Locked On Reds, your daily Cincinnati Reds podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked on Reds, your daily source for all things Cincinnati Reds. I'm Stephen Offenbaker, and he's Jeff Carr, and we love baseball. Uh, More specifically, we love these Cincinnati Reds, and we have taken our love for the game, our love for the Reds, and we have turned that love into information for you. Locked on Reds is part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. And on today's podcast, we're going to be taking a look at the Reds' financial situation as they head into the offseason. We're going to be looking at what they have to spend. We're going to be looking at how we think they should spend it. And then we're also going to take a look towards the end of the show uh, as to whether or not a certain Reds pitching coach could be on the move to a division rival. And Jeff, I think the good place to start here today will be a a nice overview of what it is exactly the Reds are obligated to spend already and what they could potentially have available to them heading into this free agent period of the offseason. So this is something that we have talked about in varying different ways. I mean, we had an episode this past season where we talked about the team control that the Reds have so much of their roster under. There are so many guys coming into next season that are pre-arbitration major league minimum players. The Reds have over $12 million of just major league minimum players. That's only $770,000. It means you got to have a lot of those guys. And it's not as if you can have you know, three or four of them, you got to have at least 12, maybe even 13 or 14 of them to do that. So much of the roster is made up of those guys. And because of that, the Reds payroll, as it currently stands, if you look at what is already committed next year, if you look at arbitration estimates, which are our favorite resource that we use on the web, spottrack.com provides us with, uh, there's still lots of room to work with. And while we say room to work with, there's no such thing as a salary cap in baseball, but we know who we're dealing with here. We're not dealing with the still the Steve Cohen's of the world or the, uh, the conglomeration of people that own the Los Angeles Dodgers. We're dealing with an ownership group that is constrained, whether you want to like it or not, that's what we're dealing with here. And we're not going to pretend that this is going to turn to MOB the show. But no, they're selling they're selling cabbages, Jeff. That's what they're doing yes. <laughs> in order to make their money. The, the, but the, we're obviously not an unlimited budget because, well, this is an Amish country. Uh, let's look at what the Reds are spending right now. Because when you look at the guaranteed money that is on the books for next season, when you look at the arbitration estimates of everyone, um, and, and just everything put together, according to spottrack.com, the Reds have total committed 46 million and change. It's basically $46.7 million next season. Steve, the league average payroll is 113 million. They got a lot to do just to get at the league average. So, um, <clears throat> they're going to spend. Right. For, for the YouTube folks, Jeff, go ahead and throw that graphic back up there. I, I want to roll through it for, for just a minute for the audio listeners. You know, talking about $46.7 million. Uh, basically, how that breaks down is the Reds owe Hunter Green $3.3 million. They own Luke Maley $3 million. They owe a $7 million buyout to Joseph Daniel Votto. They owe $1.25 million in a buyout to Will Myers, and they owe $725,000 to Kurt Casale also for a buyout. You take those numbers and you combine with them all of the other players on the roster who are either making league minimum who, or who are arbitration eligible arbitration players, and you get to that $46.7 million. You're absolutely right. When you look at that number compared to the league average Average payroll. Nick Crawl has <laughs> nowhere to go but up. There is basically a limitless amount of things that he can do in order to 
patch the holes on what is a very promising team and make sure that they are a playoff contender right out of the gate in March. What is it? March 28th of 2024. And the, and, and what we're saying is like when, in years past when we've talked about, okay, well, the reds should go into free agency and look at this group of players or look at one or two guys or something like that. The reds could literally spend 30 maybe even $40 million in free agency and still be one of the lowest payrolls in baseball. Currently, according to spot track, they set at 28. There are, uh, I was looking at the rankings about four teams ahead of them. You start getting into the $60 million. So if they add just $20 million to their payroll right now, they still don't even really get out of the, the twenties in the rankings. We're not talking about a huge shopping spree here. We're talking about probably really what the reds could reasonably go out and do. So I, I think that this is absolutely feasible. And when you kind of look at some of the numbers that spot track has allocated for arbitration, Steve, this would blow your mind, but according to spot track, if they keep Nixon Zell and go through arbitration, he is likely to make $3.6 million, which would make the highest paid Cincinnati red Nick Senzel, which I don't think Ken Griffey jr. Is not going to have that. That is unacceptable. <laughs> yeah. No, and, and that's, that's a great point though, Jeff, because we talked about this on yesterday's show that we felt like Nick crawl may have slipped up a little bit in using Nick Senzel's name when he was talking about the players for next year. But when you look at that arbitration number, if you look at what Sinzel's able to do as far as defensive flexibility, you know, at three and some change, $3 million and some change, maybe it is viable that they go ahead and accept his arbitration number and bring him back. Uh, maybe they don't let him walk. And then your hope is he continues to crush left-handed pitching and maybe you can flip him somewhere along the way. So, you know, the, the rumors of Nick Sinzel's death may be greatly exaggerated uh, depending on how this shakes out. Exactly. And then you look at Jonathan India at 3.2, Lucas Sims 2.8. I mean, these numbers are all very feasible. Like you could literally just mark them down. Reds are picking them up and then let's see what they've got in free agency because there are lots of guys out there with that the Reds could go look at. And then you talk about a trade. They have lots of financial flexibility because just a few years ago, Steve, this team was at the league average payroll threshold. Mm -hmm. They were right there around 115, 118 million dollars and as free agency goes along and people sign people, that league average payroll is going to go back up, back further to 120 and closer to 130. So you're going to see the Reds falling behind there. Plus, we're talking about the fact that the Reds have so little allocated in in payroll right now on top of the fact that they were the number one uh ticket increase in major right. league baseball, they had, they had the biggest increase in attendance of the ballpark last year, and they were top five in television audience increase. So your television revenue, uh, should be good. And, 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 and they did not. Yeah. And I, and I'm sure that also had a direct impact on the number of season ticket renewals and yes. new season ticket purchases. I mean, even me in Hawaii bought that little 13 game season ticket package that they did so that I could be sure and have some good seats for some good games and be eligible for 2024 postseason tickets. So right. I, I, I imagine that impacts because one of the things we heard from Nick crawl in his zoom press conference yesterday, Jeff, I don't know that we played that particular clip, but we heard it in the full extended zoom press conference was him saying, I have my budget already. And you and I talked about this a little bit yesterday. So when you take into account that they know where they sit right now in comparison to the other teams, and they've already set what the, the cap of the budget is, Nick crawl knows exactly now what he can and cannot do heading into the GM meetings, heading into the winter meetings, when he's having negotiations with these agents and with these players, uh, there's already a clear direction for him to go. And that is a drastic turnaround from where this team has been over the last three or four years. Absolutely huge. And all of that just boils back down to the point. This team's going to be busy this off season and we're going to be all over it here on the lockdown reds podcast with rumors and news and updates, everything that's going to be happening surrounding this team, because what they have committed in payroll, what they made last year 
And the fact that they've already got this kind of plan in place for Nick Crawl to get busy, he's going to be busy. And this is going to be an interesting offseason. As Nick Crawl has also said multiple times, whenever asked where his favor or where his his focus is on improving this team, his answer is always everywhere in any way that I possibly can. So with that in mind, we're going to give him a few ideas because you and I know what this team needs. And we're going to tell you what it is coming up next. Before we get into that, though, I want to tell you about one of today's sponsors, and that is FanDuel. There's no better time to join FanDuel than right now. You've got football season rolling on. You're getting into week 10 already. I cannot believe that we are already talking about the second half of the NFL season. College football is getting into the the stretch run of the regular season. You've got basketball, college basketball tipped off last night. You've got professional basketball, NHL hockey, all the great stuff is on FanDuel, and they've got all kinds of great promos. In fact, for the new customers, you can join right now. And if you place a $5 money line wager and you win, you're going to get another $150 in bonus bets with that $5 money line wager. So you're going to win, and you're going to win again with FanDuel. Go to FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up now. They, these promos all over the place. I mean, they've got great boost promos, whether you're talking about uh, football spreads or money lines or over unders, which I always tell you take the over in most cases, depending on what I'm looking at. And you've got this single game parlay. So you can combine a player's yardage and their touchdowns and the receptions and passes and, and rushes and all the great stuff and build an even bigger payout for yourself. It makes the sports watching experience just that much better. Awesome. Check out FanDuel today at FanDuel.com slash locked on and new customers. Once again, that $5 money line wager that wins is going to get you $150 in bonus bets back. Check it out. FanDuel is the official partner of the NFL. Thanks as always for making Lockdown Reds your first listen every single day. Every day is coming up on the next Lockdown Reds podcast. We're going to start looking at some of our player reviews. We're going to get in depth and I kind of want to set up what you can expect with those player reviews. And as we look at guys like Ellie, and as we do deep dives on Matt McClain and, and the seasons that we saw from Spencer steer and the beautiful pitching that we saw from Andrew Abbott and Alexis Diaz, and we're going to go deep on what you can expect from them next season. And we're going to start that series uh, tomorrow on the broadcast, but Steve, let's get back to looking at this because we've set up why the reds are going to have lots of money to spend. So in true, uh, lockdown reds nature, we know exactly how they should spend it. Absolutely. And we don't agree on it. So that's exactly how this is going to go. And, and and there's some of this we do agree on. Obviously, there are glaring needs that this team needs to fill. The starting rotation needs to be stabilized. The bullpen needs to be upgraded. And they absolutely have to go get a right-handed power bat to play outfield. Those are the big needs for this team. Where you and I differ is, I think, on the order uh, that this should go in and how they should go about doing it. So I'm going to go first because I'm talking right now. And for me, <laughs> I really think where they should start is in the outfield. They need a right-handed power bat to put in this lineup every day and have them go out there and drive in some runs. And we, we know that heading into 2024, there's a lot of left-handed talent out there in that outfield. We know that Will Benson is going to get on base and he's going to hit for a little bit of power and he's going to do some things but he's left-handed. We know that Jake Fraley is going to get some playing time out there and he's going to drive the ball and he's going to be great when he faces right-handed pitching. But again, he's left-handed. And then of course we have TJ Friedel in center field who showed us some things. And what he has to do now in 2024 is prove to us that that wasn't an outlier season. He's going to be the everyday outfielder until such time that it's determined that he can't be or that he shouldn't be. So that's where that outfield stands right now. And then you've got names like could Jose Barrero fill in out there? Could Nick Senzel still be around and fill in out there? Is Spencer Steer still going to play out there as part of a platoon? Probably. So even if Spencer Steer is out there as a platoon, you need another right-handed power back. So I propose that that should be the very first place that Nick Crawl looks heading into this offseason. And I'm not just coming at him blind. I have a couple of suggestions, Jeff. I think his primary target, target should be 
Teoscar Hernandez from Seattle. This is a player that is heading into his age 31 year old season. In each of the last three seasons, Jeff, he's hit 25 or more home runs. So he definitely has demonstrated consistency with his power bat. Uh, in addition to that, he's not going to be a break the bank kind of guy. We just talked about the amount of room that the Reds are going to have, the amount of flexibility that they're going to have. So again, using that website, we love spot track. Uh, he is estimated on the free agent market to pull in around $16.5 million per year. And I think there's some wiggle room there. I think that might be a little bit of a high estimate. I think Nick Crawl's smart enough to build a three-year contract that has some incentives and some options in it that could get that number down, at least the base number, down a little bit. And you can pencil in a guy into your lineup that's good for at least 25 bombs everywhere else. That means he's good for 30 to 35 at Great American Ballpark. We, we know that that's what that means, getting to play 81 games in Cincinnati in the summer. It's just as a, it's a fact that the ballpark uh, – lends itself to power. So I think that should be his primary target. Now, if they can't go get him, if that number ends up going too high, if it soars above the 16.5, another guy that's a little interesting on the free agent market comes out of Minnesota, and that's Michael Taylor. Now, this is another right-handed hitter. He's a little bit older. He's going to be heading into his age 33 season, Jeff. But last season for the Twins, he hit 21 bombs in, in what is not a, a super hitter-friendly ballpark out there in Minnesota. I mean, it's not awful, but it's not GABP. I think that you could get him for a couple year deal. Uh, Spot track estimates that his value would come in somewhere around 7.2 million. You throw a two year deal at him. You put a little pop in the lineup. You've got your right handed platoon and, and you move on from there. And I think that should be the starting point for Nick crawl in this offseason. I don't hate the idea. And I think that Tay Oscar Hernandez could likely hit like a billion home runs in great American ballpark. I think that, you know, he, he would absolutely feast here. Um, I do wonder a little bit about the idea of signing an everyday outfielder. Although I think that would absolutely shore up a lot of stuff, but if you're going to spend around $15 million or, you know, somewhere between 15 and $20 million, I want that on a starting pitcher. And I want that on Jordan Montgomery. If you're telling me you're going to spend $20 million on somebody, go get Jordan Montgomery. Dude, absolutely shoved in the in the playoffs and the World Series. It was a huge reason why the Texas Rangers won the World Series. An amazing trade deadline acquisition by them. Look, he wasn't the guy that the Reds were going to get. He was a Cardinal. Reds and Cardinals weren't ever going to make a trade. But if they go get him this offseason and they add him to the rotation. By the way, a lefty. So you like that, uh, then he will absolutely take this rotation and just elevate it to the level it needs to be, to the level that I think we believe it can be at. Because here's the thing. We keep saying, with everyone healthy, this rotation is going to be dangerous. But when has everyone been healthy? I don't want to continue to say this as we go into spring training and just say, well, when we're healthy, when they're healthy, if they get healthy, let's get somebody that can be that stabilizing force. And I was on the, I was on the train and, and I think that I would still be happy with a four or five starter when it comes to adding a starter. But if you can add this top flight guy, then everybody else falls in the line. And, and then you don't, you, you take pressure off of Hunter green to be the guy you take pressure off of Andrew Rabbit and Nick Lodolo to be the guy and they can just pitch. They don't have to worry about being the guy. So I think that if you're going to spend that 15 to $20 million on somebody on a, on a singular person, then you put that on Jordan Montgomery. And again, this falls back on what we said just a few moments ago. People are probably thinking, whoa, Bob's going to sign a $15 million check per year for somebody. Look at how much money they have to spend. When they spend $20 million on one player, they could go still sign like two or three more guys. And that's fine. This budget this, this, this payroll, this, this number that is just a number to you and me, it does not translate into any normal dollars and cents, but the number that we see on the screen has so much room to grow that yes, I believe your idea for Teoscar Hernandez or my idea for Jordan Montgomery is not bonkersville like it's been in the past. No, that's a fair point, but, but here's where I have a little apprehension, uh, 
starting pitchers aren't what they used to be. And we're talking about a once every five day guy that's going to give you five or six, maybe seven innings if you're lucky. I would rather go sign the outfielder and get Teoscar Hernandez. And then I would rather, and then take another $15 million and spend that on three really good bullpen arms and upgrade this bullpen because the Reds are already going to have six pitchers vying for five spots, possibly seven if you include Ben Lively in that conversation. Hunter Green, Nick Lodolo, Graham Ashcraft, Andrew Abbott, Brandon Williamson, Connor Phillips, Ben Lively. That makes seven guys already vying for five spots. So even if there's an injury, you've got a next man up. I think it'd be much more impactful to the team if Nick Crawl focused on outfield upgrade and bullpen upgrade, because I think those are the two areas that will impact this team every single day for 162 games. That's fair. I, I just, I don't know. Like I know what it looks like on paper, but I've never seen it on the field. So I, I just, I, I think in my mind, I, I would rather have seven than six. And I'd rather you sign a, a horse for the rotation and you, you tell Ben Lively to be that long man and say, look, we can extend you if we need you to start, but really you're like our seventh guy. So that just keep that in your back pocket for right now. You're going to be our dude that if Lodolo struggles or if Abbott struggles or if Green struggles or somebody like that, then you can get us to the seventh, eighth or seventh or eighth. But yeah, I, I, I do get what you're saying. Like the position side of thing is very lucrative if you can lock that down. And, and if we're being honest, Jeff, with the numbers we talked about in the first segment, with the financial picture that we just painted right there, they can actually afford to do all three and still come in right at league average on payroll. I mean, think about that for a second. They could get a number one starter, upgrade the bullpen with three arms, and go sign a power hitting right-handed hitter and end up league average in payroll still be where they were two years ago payroll wise absolutely this is what i know the reds will clearly have the resources and the flexibility to field a championship caliber team on day one in 2024 no matter what phil's spreadsheet says but coming up we're going to be taking a look at some shenanigans that took place yesterday out in the windy city with the chicago cubs and discuss how it could result in the reds losing one of their most well-known and popular coaches. We're going to talk about that coming up next. You can follow us in between episodes on all of the social media sites, X, Twitter. Uh, I think uh, Jeff's got his TikTok up and running. Head over there. You can find him at Jeff Carr. That's Jeff with three Fs. You can follow me at S. Offenbaker. That's with two Fs. And you can follow the show at Locked on Reds. Also, join us on our Discord server. The community over there is great. We're talking baseball. We're talking football. We're talking gaming. We're talking all kinds of things with a lot of knowledgeable, great people that just enjoy talking about all of those things if you haven't joined you're missing out head over there today the link to join us is in today's episode's description okay jeff uh there was some shenanigans out in chicago yesterday um and if i was david ross i would be like i would be ready yeah. to burn the building down on my ray out in case you missed it the Chicago Cubs went and signed themselves a new manager in the form of one Craig Council from the Milwaukee Brewers. The interesting part of that whole scenario is that they signed Craig Council before they fired David Ross. Who's more mad right now? Is it David Ross or is it Brewers fans? Like Brewers fans were beside themselves. And I was I was texting with our pal Chuck over at Lockdown Brewers, and and he's just like, dude. I, I, I know Craig council. Like we, I, I worked with his, with his brother and like, he grew up down the street and Craig council's a Milwaukee guy. This, this makes no sense. And the only thing that I can think is that Craig council is somehow like the baseball winter soldier and the Cubs just activated him and brought him home because well, number one, they gave him the richest managerial contract in MLB history. But you're right to just be like, yo, David Ross. And by the way, Cubs ownership, just like a week ago, or maybe two weeks ago, uh, came out and said, he's our guy. 
They're like, nah, I guess not he's so our guy until we find somebody good. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so here's the, here's the interesting scenario that this creates and here's why it's Cincinnati Reds related. Um, there is a well-regarded pitching coach currently employed by the Cincinnati Reds that is the former pitching coach for the Milwaukee Brewers and is very highly regarded in Milwaukee. And of course, I'm talking about Derek Johnson. Uh, we've often wondered when the calls were going to come, when we needed to start worrying about Derek Johnson leaving to become a manager. And I think some of the steps that the Castellini family and Nick Crawl took with Derek Johnson uh, last year and the year before, as far as expanding his role, putting him in charge of the entire minor league system, making him the pitching coordinator from top to bottom. All of those things were designed to make it uh, hard to lure him away. Mm -hmm. That being said, if Milwaukee throws enough money at him, uh, I could see a scenario where Derek Johnson walks away from all of that to become the next manager in Milwaukee. Well, and think about it too. He left a situation where he was man. He was the pitching coach of Brandon Woodruff, Corbin Burns and Freddie Peralta to come to the Reds and basically rebuild the pitching staff. And the reason that he came here is because he was told he would get more control over the entirety of pitching development. And he knew that. And I think that this, this is not nothing. Now, do I think that Derek Johnson is a favorite to be the next Milwaukee Brewers manager? No, but because of the pipeline, because of the respect, because of how Milwaukee still feels about him, because of how hurt Milwaukee is feeling right now. Did you see, by the way, Mark Adonacio, his, his statement about that? He said that um, uh, we lost Craig Council, but really Craig Council lost us in so many words. He, mm. he literally said he was just like, Craig Council loses the fans. He loses this community. He loses this team that he was a part of for so long. And it was just like, hmm. Okay. I'll, I'll um, tell you this, Jeff. It has me really concerned about what the Chicago Cubs have Cubs have up their sleeves for this offseason period. They're going to be busy because too. I know. can't imagine that there was not some type of presentation made to Craig Council in those conversations. Not only Craig, are we going to make you the highest paid manager in the history of the game? But wait, there's more. Here are the runs. guys we're targeting. Here's what we're going to offer them initially. Here's what we're trying to do to upgrade this team. Uh, I have a feeling that the Chicago Cubs are going to improve by leaps and bounds this offseason, and it's going to make for a, a very interesting National League Central in 2024. If he's the Cubs' winter soldier, they totally showed him a clip of like – end game whenever captain america is standing there and everyone's coming through all of the different portals that dr strange is bringing everybody from and all of the good guys are going to go attack thanos like he was just like this is what's going to happen in chicago we're going to sign everybody and this is even after the fact that marcus stroman was declined his option and he is now a free agent so they have so much money in fact i saw this um our friends over at the cespedes barbecue or the barbecue cast guys um said that his $8 million actually makes him currently the highest paid player on the roster. Uh, he's the manager too. So yeah, that's not, gonna know that's going to, that's going to change. Yeah. And so they're going to be signing some people. But with that being said, all of this just leads me to think that Derek Johnson is involved in this somehow because the brewers are feeling so hurt right now. They might turn to somebody who they know, who they trust, and they know and they trust Derek Johnson very well, and they see the job that he's done here in Cincinnati. Make no mistake about it, because I, I see these people that say these things, and uh, whether it be on X or whether it be in our comment section, you know, whenever a relief pitcher gives up a lead and they're just like, stupid Derek Johnson. If that's what you think about Derek Johnson and that is your impression of him, then you are missing 99% of the picture because this man has made the Reds pitching staff every little bit that it is right now and has set up the future the way that it currently stands. He is absolutely phenomenal at his job. I, I agree, and I, I really think he would be a tremendous loss. I hope that it doesn't happen. I hope that the Reds have done enough to keep him here long term. And 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 honestly, I think they've done a very good job of of warding off the lure of going and be a manager somewhere. You know, if you know, I've never heard Derek Johnson say my goal is to be a manager. It 
true. sounds to me and all of the things I've ever heard him say in any interview is that he really wants to be a pitching guru in complete control of a team from top to bottom, complete control of their system. And he's got that here right now. So I, I hope that's enough. And just as a funny aside, would it not be hilarious if the Brewers hired David Ross to be their manager <laughs> and, <won't> be. <laughs> and just watch how that plays out in 2024. I, I just, just as I an aside, ask, I think that would be hilarious. I did ask our, our pal Chuck over at lockdown brewers, what he thought about that. And he'd be like, man, that'd be a lot like dating your ex, man. I don't know about that, <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I, I I'm very interested to see how that turns out because, and, and also a little bit of a side note as well. And it's not necessarily, it's just kind of more of a thought, but with Craig council leaving with there being uncertainty about Corbin Burns future, I wonder if the brewers maybe hit like a little bit of a reset, but it'd be interesting to see how they approach that, but that's just speculation. And that is how we will end today's podcast. Thank you all so much. As we mentioned, this is going to be a super busy off season and that is not over optimism. That is not us just, you know, looking at everything with rose color goggles. That is us looking at the facts and seeing the way forward. Nick crawl is going to be all over the place this off season in a good way. And we're going to be all over everything that goes down at great American ballpark because we are what Steve, we are locked on reds every single day voice held on barely you made it without a coughing fit salute Almost.